thank you for the privilege, Lord, to just humble our hearts and come into your presence, Lord, together as a family, to hear your word, just to hear your spirit speak to us, to help us, to give us fresh hope, Lord, to encourage us and, and edify us, God. And Lord, we just tonight, we pray over each request, all of these, we just bring them together by faith. Lord, you're still a miracle worker. You're still the great physician. And Lord, you can heal. And so Lord, we just ask you that you would help our unbelief and increase our faith. Teach us to believe in you, Lord, that uh, Lord, the word of God is not just information to us, but Lord, teach us, Father, to put our the, the very faith that you give us in what you say and believe you for the outcome. Lord, help us to do that. We love you, Lord. We bless you. We ask you to open our spirit, our understanding, our heart tonight. Teach us your word and help us. We'll give you praise for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' name we approach. Amen. All right. Appreciate everybody for being here tonight. And... Uh, Want to, uh, I want you to turn to Luke 15. I want to read something there in just a moment. So just, just turn there and mark your uh, Bible or maybe just put something there to, so we can jump over and just read something. And then I want you to go back to Exodus. And uh, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be teaching right in here. I, I hope I'm not boring people and staying in the same places. Kind of like that one preacher preached three or four sermons, same sermons, and they come up and ask him when he's going to preach something different. He said, when we start doing this, I'll preach something different. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, a sermon good, not obeyed, is not good. A sermon bad, not obeyed, is not good, right? So we want to do our part. And uh, the Lord dealt with my heart a few weeks ago about this and uh, just feel like this is where he's got us at right now. And uh, so just... Uh, let's just practice it, right? Uh, God's purpose for your life. Let me just hit a couple of things before I read just three verses in Exodus tonight, and then we'll just ease along here. Uh, I was asked a question last week and this weekend. Uh, I was asked a question about, and I won't mention names or nothing. That's not important, but I was asked that, you know, what if, what if God has given me an encounter in my life in the past and I've uh, missed his will, you know, if, I've, if I'm kind of in that place where he uh, come to me and wanted me to do something and I just maybe neglected it or uh, put it on, uh, procrastinated, you know, put it off and, and uh, you know, where, where does that leave me? I, that's really kind of where the question is. And so I, I was praying for sister the other morning in the altars and the Lord dealt with me about something. I want to say this about that. You know, one thing that, that I learned to do is not beat myself up. Uh, and, you know, when you ask the questions, what is God's will for me or did I miss the will of God, then I think we should be reminded in Jeremiah 18 as we've been kind of hitting back and forth on as we started this, 18.6, that the clay always stayed in the Father's or in the potter's hand. Okay, so the Lord's got his hand upon us. Uh, and here's kind of the way I prayed over this sister the other morning. I, I just thought about this to, this evening when I was getting ready, so I want to share this with you. I prayed uh, that just, just you know, think about that you're on a ride. You're, you're going to get in the truck with Jesus, and you're going to ride somewhere, a long ride. Maybe, maybe I'll just say you're going to ride, y'all going to go to Dallas, okay? So what, eight, ten hours? Okay, so you're going to ride with Jesus on this journey. Okay, here, here's the key to it. Of course, let him drive, right? Let him drive. Uh, but when you get there, he tells you, when we get there, I'm going to give you something. And let's just say I'm going to reveal my purpose to you when we get there, okay? When we get there at the right timing, the right place. I'm going to reveal my purpose to you. Or I'm going to give you something. And a lot of times we get focused on what am I going to get? What's he going to give me when we get there? What am I going to get? And here's what I told the sisters. I said, listen, while you're in the truck with him for this journey, get to know him. Get to know him, okay? Get to know him. 
talk to him. <laughs> talk to him, listen to him, get to know the one you're riding with. It, may, it, it will mean a lot more what he gives you when you get there if you know the one that's giving it to you. And a lot of times in life, we go through this whole walk, we don't even know the one that's give us this deliverance. We just want what he's got for us. Okay, we're, we're prone to do that, okay? So I want to encourage you to, you know, just in, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's not a point where he's going to give us a gift and boom, you know, this is, you know, this is the pinnacle of it. No, it's about the journey getting to know the Lord. Because I'm going to tell you, if you really, if, when we really get to know the Lord, what's going to happen is what he gives us is going to come in secondary to your relationship with him. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Is that all right? All right. Let's, let's, let's open the word tonight. It's been hot weather out there, ain't it? Okay, let's look at something here tonight. Exodus 3. And, uh, of course, your Bible's probably starting to fall over to this by now, open to this. Uh, Exodus 3, we'll read 10 through 13. This is, again, Moses at the burning bush, and he gets, gets the invitation. Come now, therefore, God said, I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God said, Certainly I will be with thee. This shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people of e out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And of course we know that God said just... Say that I am that I am has sent you. So let me just say something right here that I'm uh, not planning on preaching, uh, teaching the whole hour tonight, but then again, you never know. But uh, when Moses said what he said to God, I want, I want us to get a hold of something and, and help us to get over a hurdle in life where we can step on into purpose, okay? When when. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Okay? I want you to think about something right here. That God never answered him. God never engaged in this conversation with Moses. Okay? I want you to think about that. Okay? And I'm saying that so that I can kind of carry you somewhere because a lot of times we think we got to get it all together and we got to be up to par and we got to have all of our ducks in a row, if you will, before we're even usable by God. When Moses asked the question, who am I? God never said, well, let me tell you who you are, okay? God never engaged into that toward him, okay? Now, let me just, just holding on to that thought, that mindset, when you go over to Luke chapter 15, and I want to read 17 through 22, when and this is the prodigal son, when he made a mess of his life and he started to come back home, or he decided what he needed to do, he came to himself and he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto, him, unto my father, or unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Okay, so he said, he, he kind of rehearsed this. Here's what I'm going to do. It's kind of like to get back in. Okay? Uh, I, know I'm, I know I'm probably not going to be, you know, repositioned as a son, but, you know, I'll just take what I can get. That's kind of the mindset we take a lot of times. I'll take what I can get to get back in, okay? And not only did he say, here's what I need to do, but he acted on it, and that's important. And he arose, verse 20, came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. You can, you, you can picture this story. But the father said to his servants, 
Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. I wanted to read that to say this, that his father never engaged in his plan, in his, you know, his rehearsal script, okay? He said, I'm going to go to my father. I, I know I'm the one blew it. I'm going to go to my father, and here's what I'm going to say. I know I'm not going to get the reposition of a son. I'm going to see if he'll make me one of his hired servants. Just see if I can get back in. And when he got there, he rehearsed. I mean, his father's just all over him, right? Just loving on him and, and accepting him as he is and kissing on him and just glad that he's back. His, his heart is just in re, rejoice stage and he's just loving on him. And he's sitting there getting all these hugs trying to tell his father his script. <laughs> right? Right? And his father, knowing he hears him, never does engage into his script with him. Okay? Now, let's just think about that. It's, it's human nature to think that we got to, you know, we got to please God in this way for him to accept us. Okay? Now, when I go back to Exodus, when I go back over here, I tell you that story to tell you this. When Moses said, who am I? Okay? And I know that we can think about the task before him is real big, and we'll, we'll hit on that. But the main thing is this fellow don't feel worthy. He don't feel, you know, he just don't feel that he's a qualified candidate or even a candidate. And here he begins to tell God, who am I? You know, the actions go to Pharaoh. And God never does address what he's saying because God has a plan and God, his plan was already in place. You know, regardless of how Moses feels, God's got a plan, okay? Now, God never did, watch this, he never did answer Moses or did he? Okay? Because when Moses said, who am I? He's really, I'm just going to be God just a minute <laughs> for the first time. He's really, he's really thinking, no, it ain't who am I, it's who am I. I'm the I am, not, not, not who am I, but I am who. <laughs> okay, you can figure all that out tonight, however that come out. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes I butcher my own thoughts. <laughs> but watch this, now I go there. So, so God answered Moses in this way, okay, he draws Moses' attention off of Moses to him, okay? Now, here's what I want to say about that. I want to say this, so let's move out of this arena for about three minutes. I'll hit this, and then we'll move on out of this, okay? God expects us, our Father, our Lord, our Savior, expects us to believe that he has forgiven us, Okay? To not just it be church terms and all of this stuff we do, but he wants us to really believe that he has forgiven us. And he's given us so many biblical examples that the clay is still in the Father's hands. Okay? I mean, I could spend the rest of the year right here, seriously, I mean, I could go back and talk about Jacob in the Old Testament, how God proved to him I'm a covenant-keeping God. I could step over in the New Testament and talk about Paul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, okay? I could go back, that's for the men. I could go back in the Old Testament and talk about Rahab, okay? I could go in the New Testament and talk about the woman at the well or, just, just any, or the woman we talked about Sunday morning. God has given us so many biblical examples. I mean... Free in examples, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I think there's something that some, sometimes we just need to do, and that's this. Now, don't take this wrong, but sometimes we just need to get over it, get up, and get on with it, right? Instead of just staying there, okay, we just need to, real, we need to really believe that he's forgiven us. That's done, okay? Get over it, get up, okay? And let's get on with purpose, okay? Because nobody in this Bible, nobody in this Bible except our model, Jesus Christ, 
Amen? Had to ask forgiveness. Everybody did, okay? so we, Now, let me say this. And maybe it's a help you. In, in Ezekiel 36, I'll just, just give you a little uh, thought here. Remember, God, the children of Israel, remember they went to Babylonian captivity for 70 years, okay? They went there because they were rebellious in their sinful ways. But God said before they ever went there, I'm coming to get you out. I mean, it, this stuff is, I mean, it's amazing sometimes when you get to thinking about it that God knew that when they went in there, he had an exit plan, okay? And here's what God said about the children of Israel. Now remember, they went in there because they rebelled and they were stiff-necked and they were stubborn and, you know, they were like most people today. Just being, being honest, you know. I mean, we read this stuff about them and say, why didn't they do this? And then we look at our own lives, right? Okay, so watch what he says here. Just Here's what God said, Ezekiel 36, 20. When they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. Watch this. God said, but I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Ezekiel, thus saith the Lord, the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. Okay? So you're going to learn, we're going to learn as we keep walking with the Lord. He's not doing stuff because we're perfect. He's doing it for his holy name's sake and we're privileged to get used in the process. Moses, I'm not doing this because of you. And if you was here and you, and you had never killed a man in Egypt or never had everything go wrong with you in life, I'm do, I chose you to do this through you for them, for me. Okay? So a lot of times we just really, I'm just, uh, and I know we're all human and we battle, you know, thought patterns and all of this stuff, but it's for the Lord, and he's the one made the choice to use us, okay? Now, with that said, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not teaching a cheap grace. I'm not teaching anything goes. We know that. We know the scripture teaches us there's guidelines to honor the Lord, okay? Back when I was coming up, where I was brought up, it was, the guidelines was if you step out of bounds, you got to get re-saved, <laughs> I've been saved nine times. <laughs> no, not, no, not, you know, not really. Somebody might have took that wrong. I don't mean that in the wrong way. I'm just saying, you know, we're his sons and daughters, and there's guidelines to honor and obey him. He even said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? Now, let me say it. Give you this, and we'll move on. And, and I'm about half through as it is. Watch this. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 and 7 talks about when Samuel came to anoint David, okay? And this scripture's uh, misrepresented a lot of times, okay? The Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, let's, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful because they were looking at, they weren't looking at David's heart. They were just looking on the outward appearance of what looks like a king. But let's take that scripture and talk about something just a moment, okay? Even though God is doing it for his namesake, we represent his name down here. And man don't look on the heart. Man can't see the heart. All man can see is fruit. All man can see is outward appearance. Y'all with me right here? So, if you really think about this scripture, when you, people say, oh, it don't matter. Uh, man looks on, God looks on the heart, not on the outward, outward appearance. Well, we're not preaching to, to God. We're not ministering to God. We're ministering to people. And we need to live a life to where that people are drawn to God through us. Right? Right? Even though he's doing this for his holy name's sake, 
We are to represent him, represent him on the earth. <laughs> Can I get a little head shake? <laughs> Amen. So, although man looks on the outward appearance, yes, that's all they have to look at. So we need to be, we need to practice living a life that draws people to the Lord and don't run them away from God. I'll give you an example of that, and then we'll be done with this. Years ago, I heard this story. I was in an eschatomon, a revival, and I heard this story where this uh, uh, evangelist was in this town and he was preaching every night and he was in the hotel room and he would pray and study all day and then when he would come out in the evening, there would be this man there at the, at the rest or a hotel attendant or whatever there in the front. He would invite him to church every night and he, you know, he would go on to church and the last night, the minister, the evangelist was standing there. He was on the platform and they were singing. And he looked and he saw the guy walk in. And man, he was just feeling good. You know, ah, the man came to church. I've been inviting him all week, you know. God was moving in the revival. It was great. And he just knew if he could get that man in there, God could do something for him. Well, a few minutes later, the man walked out and left. And the preacher got up. He went on and preached his sermon and he didn't know if the man had just got sick or what. So the next day when he was checking out leaving, the man was at the desk. And he said, I seen you at church last night. He said, I, I didn't know something happened. I seen you leave early. I didn't know if you got sick or what. He, and he said, that man looked there and said, well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. He said, you see that man up there on them drums beside you playing them drums? And the evangelist didn't know nobody. I mean, he's traveling through town. He said, that man ripped me off in a business deal and still owes me $200. And he said, when I walked in there and seen that guy on the platform, he said, that's all it took for me. Right? So even though God's doing it for his namesake, we want to live a life to where that we don't... Now look, I'm not digging up any bones in our past. Okay? We're learning now. We're walking with the Lord now. We're, we're, we've dealt with a scenario of forgiveness and we realize God's doing for his namesake but he's inviting me to partner with him and I need to live a life to where people are drawn to him and it's like that man said uh, the only difference in me and him is he goes to church and plays the drums and I don't I don't go to church and we don't want to live a life like that right we want to live a life that the Lord, that we honor the Lord, that it draws people to the Lord, right? Everybody good with that? So here in verse 12, the Lord turns it off of all of that. And in Exodus, uh, where we at? 3 and 12. And the Lord told Moses, he said, and the reason is, is because this task... I, Forget about the past. That's done. All of the childhood stuff we've preached, right? We've popped veins on, right? <laughs> all of the, 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 the sin of a lifetime, all of that's behind Moses, okay? What's in front of him is the purpose of God, a task that is bigger than he is, okay? That's what God's going to invite us into. He's not going to invite us into something we can do because that don't require faith. In him, right? <laughs> Give me a head nod in the house. <laughs> Amen. And so I'm used to response. Y'all know I want to preach in a black church. <laughs> Just you heard that, didn't you? <laughs> and so, uh, so now here he is. Okay, he's come to this place where he realizes, hey, I'm, I'm getting really called to do this. I'm, get, I'm being invited. I'm being called to go rescue God's Gershoms, God's people, his babies, his children, out of the world, out of a strange place, and bring them into, the, into this land, okay? So he realizes how big this is, okay? It's a place for fear and uh, what? Uh, inadequacy, just, you know, uh, feels like I'm, I, I can't do it. Well, that's really where God wants us to be as a place where we depend on him. Okay, so Moses is here and the Lord gives him this word. He says, certainly I will be with you. In other words, God is not saying, hey, 
Here, here, here's, I'm in a hurry. I got things to do. Here, get, let me give you four things to run down there to Egypt and get these people out. He's not sending them out on his own. He's really saying, me and you's going. Because I done taught here where that God said, I've come down to deliver them, but I'm sending you. So in other words, I'm asking you to partner with me in this. That's where we're at. And that's what God is doing. He's given us, he's given Moses a, uh, you know, a comfort, if you will, uh, an encouragement uh, that it's not you, it's I'm going to be with you. I'm not sending you out on your own, okay? Now, many of you have heard me share the little old quick story about my speech class in school. I failed speech because the speech teacher told me, you're going to have to do a five-minute speech on anything you want in front of the class. And hey, literally, I know y'all ain't going to believe this, some of you peers, but I had an A in that class. Hey, that's huge, man. Seriously. And he said, Jamie, you're going to have to do it or you're going to fail. It, it, that's, it's going to bring your grades so far down. You're going to fail, especially with some, it's supposed to get deeper, you know. Anyway, cut fat. I said, I'm not doing it. I am not standing up in front of this class and talking about anything. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't stand up and talk about it. I seen them get up there and just couldn't even hold their paper. And I'm sitting back there, <laughs> I ain't doing that. And I did. He, he even really called me off the side. I said, look, I just need, I said, I'm telling you. He said, you're going to fail. I said, I mean, I failed before. I'm just trying to tell you, I'm not getting up in front of this class and speak. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, there's a, there's, a, there's a humility and there's a, a really a, a, a nerve issue when you when I get up to start to speak, but I love it now. I love it, man. I mean, I, I'm sitting there and I always say, man, I'll be glad when we get this going tonight, right? But I couldn't do it then. But see, when the Lord calls you into something, He's going to be with you. He's going to be with you. He's All He needs is availability out of us. All He needs is willingness out of us. He don't need your super skills, okay? He don't need all of that. He just needs you, right? And that's where we're at here. Moses said, uh, God said, certainly I will be with you. Let me give you another little quick testimony about when I started preaching. And, uh, you know, me and Sandy, we, when we, we got married in July, and I preached my first sermon in August, Okay? So we started in the ministry right off the bat, okay? And I got a lot of stories I could tell you. But uh, so when we preached our first sermon uh, at Crossroads, it was on Joseph. I, I, taught, I walked around and talked about the whole life of Joseph. I mean, just God anointed him, and I could just see the whole story, and I just talked the whole story, you know? I don't know if I ever preached a point. I just told the story. It was good. I felt like it was awesome. So we went up to uh, Richton where Brother Don was, preached our second sermon, and I preached on the woman with an issue of blood. And when I got there and started preaching, I, don't, I guess I could call this inauguration from, from above, seriously. I was literally, God, God so anointed me in that service that I was walking toward a wall and the words was in front of me. And I was just, whoa, I'm catching these words. I'm saying them, and I'm catching them. And I was thinking, man, and literally this is what happened. One time in that sermon, going toward this wall, one time in that sermon, I was saying, this ain't even me preaching. I mean, really, it was that, it was that dimension and level that, and what it was was God was really, he was, it was like, to me it was inauguration. I, I swear, I, I define it. Well, when we left her, I, here's what I said. I got this. I mean, I got this. <laughs> See, when God says, certainly I will be with you, he said, he's you don't want to go without me. Okay? So I was thinking, I got this. So next time I get invited to preachers down at Salem Full Gospel at a youth rally, <laughs> every church was down there. It was packed out in that old church. And when I walked in there, I was thinking, y'all finna get it tonight. I mean, really, that's how proud I was. I mean, really. And God had to teach me. I was thinking, 
I, here's literally what I said. I'm, I'm confessing. I was on the pew and Sister Annie Faith Flurry was, you remember Hornet's Nest? Y'all remember Sister Annie Faith? Just a devout. And they was all singing and I was thinking, would they get through singing and let me get up there? I'm serious. I'm finna I'm tear this place apart. And I got up there and Sister Annie, oh, we got a young man back there. And she just bragged on me. And I was sitting there just like a big gobbler bowed up. You know, I was thinking, when I can get up there, and I got up there and, yeah, I appreciate y'all living. Let's go to the book of Psalms chapter 1. I, I still know where I preached. <laughs> I <laughs> preached. <laughs> and I got up there and I thought, well, you know, I, it's fixing to happen like it did up yonder, so I'm just going. And I left the pulpit. I started, and when I got about right here, I realized I'm alone. I'm alone. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm by myself. Okay. <laughs> And the Lord taught me that night, he said. I mean, it was, it was humiliating, honestly, honestly. I remember Arvella. <laughs> Y'all remember Arvella? Arvella was in the youth hall eating Arvella. said, he got an ornament tonight, and I wanted to say, shut up. I just want this to be over. I want to go home, and, and I want to crawl over, over, you know, get out in the woods and just beg God to forgive me, really. Seriously, it's, that's how bad it was. It bad. It was bad. That's when them kind where people said, can I have my offering back? <laughs> but the Lord was teaching me, hey, it's, it's me. I will be with you. See, this. anytime you try to do something, you're going to flop. John chapter 3, that that is born, maybe verse 6 right there, that that is born of the flesh is flesh, and that that is born of the Spirit is in other words, if it's born from above, that's what we want to walk in. Okay, we want, to, we want to walk in the Spirit and let God birth something from us from above, okay? So I'll give you this little old example. That happened, and talking about, you know, the Lord being with us. We were in Mexico on a mission trip, and we were way up in the mountains. We're talking five hours from civilization up in the mountains. We're talking about where pastors ride bicycles and stuff. And it was very remote. Some of you men probably have been up there with a uh, fellowship at Crossroads years ago. Well, all the people were there that was the, the overseer and the, you know, ministers. I was, re what, 27 years old, Sandy, probably? 26. Well, they, Brother Mills asked me, he said, Brother Jamie, you want to preach? I said, oh yeah, I'll preach. I'll, and, and, so he said, we're going to go to this other village and you're going to preach. And then after I said it, I got thinking, ooh. And then they told me you're going to have to preach with an interpreter. And I'm thinking, ooh, you know. Then So we're on the bus. Here, I'm just telling you, when you're in the Lord's will, he'll confirm things to you and he'll let you know I'm with you. Let me just, let me just tell you what happened. I'll never forget this. And it may not rest or high with you, but it did with me because it, got, it was personal. I'm on the bus and I'm sitting there. We're going to the, I say on the bus, on the van. And I'm over there in the uh, scriptures where Jesus rode the little coat. They untied the coat. You know, Jesus rode the coat down into Jerusalem. They, Hosanna, you know, they, uh, palm branches and coats and all that, worshiped him. And I'm, I'm going to preach that story right there. That's what's on my heart. And I'm, I'm on the van, and everybody's just talking. Man, I'm in, I'm in high humility, heavy humility over here. I'm fixing to preach in front of these people with an interpreter, and I'm, I'm pleading, I'm begging with God. I mean, I'm, I'm reading, going down the road. I'm looking, and the Lord's dealing with my heart about these, riding this, this donkey in this scripture, okay? If, if a donkey could carry the gospel, any of us can, right? That was my text, Somewhat. Anyway, I'm thinking, man, can I do this? I mean, can I can I preach with an interpreter? What is you know? I mean, I'm all the, all the big preachers are with us, and we're riding down this road, and literally this is what happened. I look, I just looked up out in this field, and there was a herd of donkeys in this field. Seriously, there was a bunch of donkeys and coats in this field, and it was like the Lord said, "Hey, I mean." Here it is, there it is, here I am, let's go, right? The, 
the Lord so anointed that service that night that Brother Dillard, the man that, uh, Sandy, you know who I'm talking about, the uh, missionary director, every time I seen him, he said something about that sermon. Every time. I'm just telling you, when God says, I'm with you, I'm choosing you to do this, he means it. He means it. He means it. It's not just a scripture. It's not something he put in there because he needed to fill space up. He means that if you will listen to me and, and, and love on my Gershams, invite my Gershams, my children, my, the ones I died for, if you'll reach out, I'll, I'll reach through you. I'll, I'll be with you. You know, you're thinking, I can't do it, I can't do it. Yes, you can do it because he's going to do it through you. Yes, you can minister to that person you work with. You can love on them. You can reach out to somebody. You can be used by God as a vessel, right, to reach somebody that nobody else is going to reach because the Lord is going to be with you. He's going to do it. He's going to do it for you. He just needs you to be available for him, right? So with that said, I just wanted to give you a couple of scriptures and we'll close with these last, this last verse. Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost, and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Watch this. For God was with him. For God was with him, right? Luke 16 and 20. I wanted to just share that with you right there where, where he was commissioning the disciples. That's not the right verse. Mark 16, thank you, Lord. He beat somebody to the draw, didn't he? So when, when Jesus was, was leaving, he said something here. When they, when they obeyed, okay, he told them to go out and preach the gospel, okay? He told them to go out and be witnesses, if you will, to testify, all of this stuff. So then after the Lord had spoken, he was received up into heaven, set on the right hand of God. Verse 20, they went forth, they went forth, and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. The Lord working with them. Let it, let it speak to you, church. The Lord working with them. Okay? Here's something that I'd like to just point out. If God can take one man and go get two or three million out, what's... What's happening today when he's got two or three million and it's all we can do to get one out? I, I'm not being, I'm not condemning, I'm not wanting anybody to feel bad. It's just a challenge that are we doing any witnessing for the Lord? Are we doing any testifying? Are we sharing the good news with anybody? I just want to encourage us. There's Gershoms everywhere. There's people everywhere out there. Okay? And our life can be that testimony, but there's some people that need hope verbally. Right? They need hope verbally. Uh, let's see. John 3, 2, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, let me, let me read to you what he said. In John 3 and 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles except that, that thou doest, except God be with him. Church, he is with us. He is with us. He is with us. You believe that? Look, Evan Roberts in the Welch Revival, one of my favorite men to read, read on. He, he would pray prayers like, Rend the heavens, bend me, Lord. I mean, just, I love his documentary. I love to read and read, oh, just keep reading about him. I just love it. But it just, it just his, his life is like one of the cloud of witnesses to me. It speaks to me, okay? 
Evan Roberts went in this church in the Welch Revival, and at that time, the Welch Revival, 1904, right in there, right before Azusa Street, the Welch Revival had already spun off about 30 more revivals at that time. And Evan Roberts would go to these other churches. He went in this church one night, and he told the people, he said, do you really believe that the promises of Jesus are precious? I mean, he was just talking from his heart. Do you really believe that Jesus, when he says something, he means it? And all the people, was, of course, yes, amen. He said, do you really believe that Jesus, when he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of the yes. He said, y'all really believe that scripture? Yes. He got his coat and his hat and he said, y'all don't need me here. And he went to another meeting. And that happened. He said, if you really believe that the Lord is with you, you don't need anybody else. Now that don't mean that God ain't got an order set up and all of that. I'm just saying, if you really believe he is with you, he's, he's laid this person on your heart. He showed you this hurting Gershom. He showed you somebody in your life during this teaching that, that they're a stranger out there and, and they need a family. And God said he would set the solitary in families. And you really believe that, then God will be with you to go and minister to them. Because let me tell you something. If God deals with your heart about somebody, he's already dealing with their heart. And they're already crying out. He's already working on both ends. He really makes it easy for us, right? So here in verse 12, I'll close just saying this. Uh, let me get to where we are. Exodus 2, right? 3. Exodus 3. He said, Certainly I will be with thee. And look at this. This shall be a token unto thee that that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Watch what God just said. Not if you bring them out, but when you bring them out. <laughs> Not if you bring them out. See, God prophesies here a reached mile marker before Moses ever puts his shoes back on. Not, not if you bring them out. In other words, God was saying, I didn't allow you to go through everything you went through to get you right here and come down here and meet with you and set this bush on fire and give you an encounter if we can do it. If we can get it done. No, he says, when you bring them out, there's going to be a sign, a token. You're going to bring them right here to this mountain. Right? Watch this. You ready? Verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, not if I come, <laughs> not if I come, but when I come to them. In other words, Moses is saying, All right, all right, if you're with me, you give me this encounter, you give me this assignment, you're with me, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And you can do it, church, right? Now, we got to get untied from the wind. Like, when am I going to do it? Procrastinating, neglecting. We got to get untied. Let me go a little deeper. We got to get untied from the if. Okay, because the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6 and 2, I believe it is, that it don't say today is the day of salvation. It says now, now. Read it real close. Y'all don't believe that, do you? Let me read it to you. <laughs> Let me read it. I'll close on this. Let's see if I... Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation of somebody being delivered. Not, not just today, because you know what today does? Today always turns into tomorrow, don't it? Right? So we've got to get untied from if I'm going to do it and when I'm going to do it one day, that I am going to do it. I am going to do what God has called me to do because the Gershoms are crying out. 
Okay, my time's running out. Let me say this. If you keep running into that person, if you keep running into that person, if you sit in this church two or three services and that same person's on your mind, that's a Gershom. Don't put it off. Because you know what God does? He gives us windows. Okay? Please hear what I'm saying. Please hear what I'm saying. Just, just like the other day, uh, well, I hear this all the time. You know, when we hear somebody passed away, I'll run in and say, man, I just talked to him the other day. Man, I felt like going to talk to him. Okay? And the enemy is just keeping us distracted. Okay? So if that person's on your heart, this is what it boils down to. It's not you having an encounter with God every time you come to church and it's all good and you soak and you just keep taking it in. Okay? God's laying that person on your heart. All of this he's doing is for that, for them. Okay? That's what, that's what the Lord's dealing with our heart about. Okay? The woman in John chapter 4. I'll close. Brother Brian wants us to pray for him. We'll pray for anybody. That woman in John chapter 4. Uh, on the well, woman on the well, right? So after she left her water pot, uh, pot uh, met Jesus, met the lover of her life, right? Goes into the city. Who's in the city? The disciples are in the, in the city buying meat. This woman goes into the city and says, come see a man that's told me everything I've ever did. Is not this the Christ? She goes in there and testifies and witnesses. Moses didn't have a sermon when he went to Egypt. He had an encounter. He had a testimony. And he had a name, I am. That's his name. Okay? This woman goes in there and she tells the whole city. Okay, this is Samaritans. Okay, so they all, the disciples come back and that woman empties out the city. The disciples just bring back food. Right? And... They asked Jesus, you want something to eat? He said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat's to do the will of the Father. And that's when he told them to pray that laborers would be brought into the kingdom. The harvest is near, right? So when he said, lift, look, lift up your head, look, lift up your eyes and look into the fields for they are white already under the harvest, that was all them Samaritans. They wore white apparel, solid white, like a Muslim, solid white. And that, here comes... Here comes the white fields of harvest because a woman had an encounter with God and ran in there and told everybody about Jesus. But the disciples, Peter, James, John, the big wheels, they went in there and bought meat. They didn't empty, they didn't get nobody out. Why would I even say that? I say because you just don't realize how powerful your encounter and your testimony is. And let me go ahead and say this. And God did not pick out a perfect Hebrew to get them out. He picked out one that had been there, knew their suffering, and had marred places in the clay. Right? Go back to that woman. I'm closing right here. Go back to that woman. Here's these disciples. How do you think they felt? You know, this happens all the time in church. You ever notice this? People that's been to church 20 years that ain't got nobody on their pew. And here comes somebody in and get fired up for God and bring three or four people next Sunday. Y'all ain't helping me, are you? <laughs> right? That's all I want to say. <laughs>